So hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to the last day of the conference, uh, the session just after lunch. So I'm sure everyone's really sleepy after their lunch. So to get into the spirit for today, I'm wearing my NDC London badge from last January. That's kind of helping me remember what a physical conference is like. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. So um, I, like a lot of other people in the UK at the minute, I have to do homeschooling. So I'm kind of juggling um, different sessions with my wife. So once I've finished here, I do need to go back um, to help out there. So what I want to ask is if you have any questions during the talk, if you could post them onto the Slack channel, uh, I think we're in track three, uh, and just tag me in there. Or if you want to send me something private, do that. And then I'll do my best to try and answer any questions a little bit later in the afternoon. Uh, so with that, uh, today I want to talk about writing cross-platform games with Monogame in .NET, which is a bit of a mouthful. So first of all, um, just to introduce myself, so my name is Stephen Haunts. Um, these days I spend the majority of my time uh, writing and recording content for Pluralsight and Skillshare. I've been doing that for about six years now. But previously, before doing kind of what I do now and in you know, the career I've had in financial services, etc., the start of my career, um, in this magazine article is from when I was 16, is I always had a passion of building computer games. And when I was 16, me and my friend Chris, we, we bought a game on the Amiga 500, this was, called Dark Mission, which was due to be published um, by a small publisher called GKS Design. And that was kind of my first foray into the computer games uh, world. Then after that, I worked for about 10 years in companies like Argonaut Software, Core Design, IDOS, Criterion Studios, Electronic Arts. Then I finished up my gaming career at a small little company called Full Fat Productions. So if you've heard of a game called Flick Golf, um, they're the company that built that. And, you know, it's one of the, well, it's certainly a very fun time in my life when I was younger. So I worked on lots of really cool games. It's on the screen there. You can see Croc Legend of the Gobos on the Game Boy Color. That was, one, that was my first ever published game, which was amazing. I uh, did some work on the Alien Resurrection game on the PlayStation. That was my first introduction to projects that go horribly wrong. because it was very late. I think it came out about 18 months after the film. And I've worked on games like Sid Meier's Pirates for the PSP. Uh, then in the bottom right there, we've got Sims Pets on Nintendo DS. And whilst that game wasn't particularly good, I was quite proud of it because we had from start... Well, from starting development to getting the cartridges made and then onto the shelves, we had nine months. So that was quite a, a big achievement to do that. And then on the bottom left there, we have a game that was never sadly released, but it was uh, Black and White Creatures on the Nintendo DS, which was an amazing game. We'd almost finished it. We were literally three months away from completion. But the publisher who had the publishing rights to that game sadly went bust, so it couldn't get released, which is a real shame. So I've worked on lots of um, kind of game production development tools as well. So back when I used to work at companies like Criterion Software, who were then bought out by Electronic Arts, we built a system called RenderWare Studio. Now, if you think about um, platforms like Unity that you have now, RenderWare Studio was basically like Unity, but about six years before Unity ever came out. And it was a commercial development tool. So, you know, it's quite a high price tool that we charge the developers. And it allowed you to kind of build up all your game assets into a world. You could assign C++ behaviors to all your different entities in the game. And you could link everything together with events and kind of you know, build your game that way. And then at the bottom of the screen there, you can see that you had like connections to different consoles. So at the time, GameCube was the in thing from Nintendo, as was PS2 and the original Xbox. So what this let you do is you could connect to all these different consoles in real time, drag all your assets into the scene. And then at the same time on each of the consoles, you could see all the game being developed live in front of you. It was really quite cool. Anyway, fast forward into to now. So last year when we was in lockdown, so actually before I say that, you know, I, when I left the games industry, I then went into financial services and got what my wife calls a proper job. I did that for a bit and worked across various different kind of enterprise style businesses. Um, fast forward to now. So when we was in lockdown last year in 2020, or lockdown v1.0, as you like to call it. Like most people, I was kind of, you know, struggling with the whole idea of it. And I kind of had this sort of bright idea that I wanted to, to build something. Because the way that I deal with things like depression and anxiety is I need to be able to create something. I need something that I can focus my mind on. And that's kind of how I get myself through difficult periods of time. 
So I wanted to focus on, to, on a little problem that I could solve over time, something that's not work related. So nothing to do with approval site, nothing to do with enterprise development, you know, nothing work related, no pressure on it. And then using techniques from like books like uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, um, that book talks about how you kind of visualize success and what success looks like. So you, you basically try and imagine a point in time in the future where everything's gone well. And then you kind of use that as a way of sort of mentally preparing yourself to get out of a difficult situation. So one of the things that I would mentally visualize was actually talking at a conference about this thing that I built, which is kind of what we're doing now. So it kind of feels like it's come full circle a bit. But then, you know, as you're building something, you kind of, pardon my French, you study the shit out of it. You know, you spend a lot of time trying to read up on different subjects and different libraries and different development techniques. And it's just a way of being a bit of a distraction against kind of all the stuff that's going on um, during the day. Then the idea was you just take small steps every day. So on a good day, I might get to spend about an hour just tinkering around with some code. On another day, it might be 10 minutes. But every day, you're just trying to move that needle ever so slightly to actually produce something. So I decided that I wanted to build a little game. Nothing too complex, nothing that I intended to ever release. You know, it's not going to be a commercial product. I'm not intending on making any money off of it. I'm not going to do any courses or books on it. It was just a nice little distraction. So the first thing I had to think about was, do I want to use an engine or do I want to use a framework? Because there's two quite distinct differences between the two. So in modern game development, an engine is something like Unity or Godot or Godot, however you pronounce it, or Unreal Engine. So these are all systems that you can download for free and build games with. And the reason why they're called an engine is because they really do everything for you. So when you come to building a game in these systems, you're not worrying about rendering, you're not worried about textures, lighting, sound, input handling, or any of that. That's kind of all done for you. You have the game engine sitting in front of you. So what you're dealing with at that point is, you know, building assets, linking everything together and actually creating a game. And quite frankly, they're brilliant. Some of these systems are absolutely fantastic, considering most of them don't actually cost any money. But what I wanted to do is kind of leverage and sort of build up some of the skills that I've got, which my background since leaving the games industry has all been sort of .NET development and C Sharp. So I kind of wanted to still play in that pond, but build something a bit more fun. You know, I didn't want to do anything enterprisey. So I started looking at the Monogame framework. Now, the Monogame framework is something that I knew about. I've known about it for years, but never really put much emphasis into it. And the Monogame framework is an open source implementation of a library that Microsoft used to create called XNA. Now, XNA was one of Microsoft's early game development libraries that they built, and it came out kind of around the time of the Xbox 360. And it was a way of encouraging developers to build indie games that could be sold on Xbox Live Arcade. Um, but sadly, Microsoft discontinued it, which is a real shame because it was very good. And the Monogame framework was an open source implementation built by enthusiasts to try and replicate the features of XNA. And really, it's kind of taken off, you know, it's got an entire life of its own. Uh, many commercial games are built with it. So one that people are probably familiar with is Stardew Valley, which is probably one of the most famous ones, uh, which is, a, you know, kind of a very cute cartoony farming simulator um, that's available on, you know, PC, Mac, and even games consoles. So the good thing with XNA is if you um, pre-compile all of your code, you can actually run it on like Nintendo Switch consoles, for example. So when you look at a game framework like XNA, um, it doesn't really do a lot. Um, when I started building this engine, I started thinking to myself, well, do I want to worry about 3D or 2D? And I didn't really want to worry about 3D because XNA and Monogame does do 3D, but you have to do a hell of a lot of work to do it. It's very complicated. And I just didn't want to give myself that kind of mental stress. I thought, oh, well, I'll stick to 2D because 2D games are fun. So really, something like Monogame gives you some very basic features. It gives you a basic maths library. It gives you the ability to play sound effects and music. You've got input handlers. So for the keyboard, uh, a games controller and a mouse. It gives you a basic asset pipeline, which I'll talk about in a moment. And it gives you the ability to rasterize graphics onto the screen. So if you have a sprite of a character, you just want to splat it on the screen, it allows you to do that. It doesn't really do a huge amount more than that, to be honest. So you have to build some functionality on top of that to actually be able to build a game. So you have to build your own engine. 
So the things I had to look at was game state and scene management, um, some basic UI controls, a messaging system so that different assets in the game can actually talk to each other, uh, font rendering, just so you can like you know show like high scores and menus, uh, sprites and animation, some collision detection, and a scene graph. So a scene graph is basically like a directed graph of nodes where you might have different sprites all linking together to build a scene on the screen. So Monogame is straightforward to install. So you can go to the Monogame website. Um, you can download a package to install. So I use the Mac. Um, that's just kind of what I prefer. But it works on Mac and Windows. Just, you know, works fine across both. You install the installer, and then that gives you a series of templates when you do your file new solution, which is quite cool. Now, the code that I've built I've open sourced it, I've just put it out for free and I've tried to make it as tidy and neat as possible and include lots of tutorials so that it's actually kind of easy to pick up. So if anyone does want to take a look at it, it's at github.com slash stephenhorn slash exogame2d, which is a funny little name I just gave the engine because obviously you have to think about branding first. Now what I want to do during this talk is I've kind of got two versions of this talk. I've got the version that I do at user groups, and that lasts nearly two hours, which is kind of spending a lot of time diving through code, but we only have an hour. So what I want to do is focus on some of the patterns that I've used to build some of these games using Monogame. And um, so I'm not doing a direct code, code walkthrough, but then what we'll do is at the end, if we've got a bit of time, we'll kind of dive into Visual Studio and I'll show you where everything is and kind of show you how it works. Now, when you, Look at it in um, GitHub, for example. So you've got a whole series of tutorials that I've started writing, and I'm going to write a load more. And the intention is to write a few blog posts around it as well. So the tutorials take you through things like, you know, how to render a blank screen, how to draw a sprite, how to move a sprite, how to track and use the mouse, how to do some font rendering, and how to do collision detection. And I've got a whole list of other tutorials I want to add as well. So when you load up the solution, um, you're presented with, um, well, the top-level solution folder is called Engine. There's a project in there called Exogame 2D, and that's kind of where all the heavy lifting of the engine lives. It's stuff that, you know, if you're interested, you can dive in and have a look at, or it's stuff that you can just use without necessarily getting into the details, which is quite cool. And during lockdown, I built two little projects just for a bit of fun. So the first one at the top there is I built a little recreation of Nintendo's Duck Hunt. So if anyone old enough remembers the original Nintendo NES console, or the Famicom, I think it was called in America. Then they had a game called Duck Hunt that you played with a little light gun, and you could shoot these cute little ducks. And so I did a little recreation of that, and I also did a fun recreation of Conway's Game of Life. And I did that kind of as a, as a tribute to, to Mr. Conway, who sadly passed away last year, which was quite sad. So I did a little tribute to that. So I've just got a video that I'll show you here first. So what you can see here is Dark Hunt itself. I apologize for the music. Let's see if I can turn that down. Okay, turn that down. So the premise is quite simple. You just shoot these little ducks. As you shoot the ducks, you've got a little bullet counter at the bottom. And then you've got a little duck counter there as well. And then a high score at the top. So this kind of features quite a lot of um, different techniques in the engine. So you've got collision detection. We've got sending messages between different events. So as you shoot the gun, the gun sends out an event. If it detects a collision with a duck, it plays the death animation and the death sound effect. It then sends a message to the high score and sends a message to the counters at the bottom. And then at the end of a level, when you run out of ducks, it sends a message to this little marquee that scrolls down. So it's all very sort of message and event based. So the second project that I built was Conway's Game of Life. I'll show you a little demo of this now. And it's like a little paint package. You just um, draw on the screen. And then when you run the simulation, it runs a Game of Life simulation. But what I did is I added an extra little uh, rule to it. So as each cell um so for every each, each generation of the cell i slowly fade the colors out and they slowly die over time and it kind of gives it that nice kind of fading out technique which looks quite cool 
That is one play, because if you, if you draw a straight line and then let it run, it actually creates this quite nice pattern, which I thought was quite cool. Yeah, anyway, so let's go to the next bit. So starting out with Monogame, the first thing you want to do is, or well, well, when you build anything, you want to start out with that library's equivalent of a Hello World. Now, the way you set up a program in Monogame is very straightforward. So everything kind of runs through a, a static main method. You set up uh, the game loop function, which is a Monogame um, class, and you call run on that method. And then what you do is you have a class that derives from game, sorry, the main, the main class is called game, and then we create our own instance on top of that, our own instantiation on top of that. So in the constructor here, we set the, or we initialize the engine. So in this case, we're saying we want a 1080p play service. We set the mouse to visible. We then have a, a method that's overridden where you can load your content. And then we have two methods, so we have update and draw. So update is where you would ordinarily update your game logic and any physics and AI that might run in the game. In this case, we're just checking for some button presses. So escape closes the game and F1, sorry, F switches between full screen. And then you do your actual rendering in the draw method. So in this case, we're just clearing and setting the color to blue for the background color. So that's kind of the, the easiest type of application you can write. Again, I'll try and demo this at the end and actually look through code properly. In this instance here, so we've got the load content method. Uh, so we're loading up a logo. So you see we've got load content and we've got an asset called XO engine logo. And then in our draw method at the bottom, we do engine.begin render, and then we can just render that scene to the screen. So a scene is kind of like a, you know, a directed graph of objects that you can build. So as you add different objects to the scene, they'll get added to the render list. So you're not rendering individual sprites explicitly, you add them to the scene and then you say to render the scene. So Monogame comes with something called an asset pipeline. So typically when you write a game, you want to get assets into the game. So assets will be things like textures and sprites, sound effects and music and fonts as well. But typically when you have an asset like this, you need to convert it into a format that's going to be usable by the game engine. So XNA provides a simple tool called the Monogame Pipeline tool. So here, we, you know, on the left in the project, you can see we've got the assets for the Duck Attack game. So we load all those in, and you can then compile all those assets into an asset file, which then gets included in your project. And when you go to load, um, say, the crosshair.png, you refer to it by name, so you just say, you know, load the asset crosshair, and then that will load that into the game. So managing assets is pretty straightforward. Now, the way a game like this works is you have a very tight uh, game loop and it just runs as fast as it can. And then as you saw in the little snippet of code earlier, what we're trying to do is we're trying to separate all of our scene updating from our rendering. So those two things happen differently. So if you're updating positions or velocities on a sprite, so that will happen in the update method. Then all the render method does is it's just concerned with just getting stuff onto the screen as fast as it can. And effectively from that, your game is just one big giant state machine. It's a massive finite state machine. So you could have um, a game state, which is like, you know, main menu, game level, def screen, and then you just switch between different states. And then as you go and call render, it checks what state is in. It just renders the appropriate scene. Now you want that to run as fast as it can in a loop. You know, you're trying to achieve at least 60 frames a second, if not more. So what this means then is when you do things like async, so when you do a game in a mono game, you don't really have things like async and await, so you're not letting .NET handle all of the asynchronous um, stuff for you, because that's not really what you want. What you want is a, a loop that runs as fast as it can, and then you work out, you kind of budget how you're going to use your 60 frames a second as best you can. So one thing that I had to deal with when I started building the engine was something called view projection scaling. So when going full screen, so if you imagine you've got a game running in a window like the demo you saw, typically you're going to run a game in a full screen mode. So when you initiate full screen, there's going to be a request down to the graphics driver, and it's going to try and get the whatever render surface the graphic driver tells it to use. So I mean, I'm presenting on an iMac at the minute, so it's going to be like 5,000 pixels by something ungodly. 
You could be running on something that has a native resolution of 1080p, or you could be running on a system that has a 4K screen. Or if you're using a Mac Pro, you might have a 6K screen, for example. Now that makes it quite difficult when you're trying to actually render stuff in certain positions on the screen. So if you remember back in the original snippet of code we showed, we set up a, an initial game window of 1080p. Now if I was to get that 1080p window and tell it to go full screen, if it starts switching the coordinate system that you're using to saying that's much higher resolution, it's going to kind of make your assets kind of explode all over the screen, a bit like a, a bit of bad written CSS. So what you want to do is you want to have this kind of like virtual resolution of 1080p where you place your sprites and then have the game engine kind of work out where that's actually going to be on the physical screen. And that's called view projection scaling. And Mono Game by itself doesn't do that for you, which is a bit of a pain in the bottom. So you have to write some complex code to do it. Now, this is actually the hardest part of the engine to getting this bit right. So I had to kind of rely on a lot of old legacy GitHub uh, repos and a really old book about X and A to work out how to do this properly to make it kind of seamless. But in this instance here, you know, we've got the 1080p screen um, that's actually being rendered to, but that's actually being projected onto a screen that's 5,120 by 2,880 pixels. But the game doesn't care what the final native resolution is. It just wants to know if I put something at 50-50 on the screen, you know, X50, Y50 on the screen, is it going to appear in the same position when you go full screen? So that took a bit of a uh, bit of doing. Now, the next bit I had to deal with was sprites and rendering sprites. So a sprite is effectively just an array of pixel data. So it's RGB values or RGB alpha values. Because if you use a PNG, then you can have a transparency layer. So you can actually have your sprites be see-through, which is kind of desirable. So those sprites go through the image asset pipeline. So the little tool that I showed um, before, and then you can load it into a sprite object in Monogame, then you can just tell it to render to the screen, which is nice and simple. So some of the examples of sprites we've got in the duck attack game. So we've got some different sprite animations of the sort of the duck flying. There's like three or four frames of it flying. We've got the crosshair that you use to shoot the ducks. We've got the death animation. So when you shoot the duck, it kind of goes into this kind of weird flashy animation and it kind of dives to the bottom of the screen. And then we've got the bullets and the little duck registers at the bottom. So they're all sprites. But game is kind of boring unless you have an uh, unless you have animation. So what I then had to write was an extension that sits on top of my sprite class, which allows you to do very basic animation. So the way or the techniques I had was linear interpolation and ping pong. So linear just means if you've got three frames, one, two, and three, it will literally just go render frame one, then two, then three, one, then two, then three, and so on. Whereas ping pong, it'll go render one, two, three, two, one, two, three. And it, that, that's kind of what helps you get that kind of interesting flapping effect on the bird. So another one of the things you need to worry about is input management, which thankfully is one of the easiest parts of XNA. So it supports um, game controllers, so I tested it with a, or some of the things I was playing with, I tested it with a PS4 controller, works perfectly fine. And sort of mouse and keyboard as well. So this particular game uses the mouse tracking of the X and Y for the crosshair, it uses the left mouse button for shooting. If you want to go to full screen, you hit the F key and it toggles to full screen. And then escape just takes you back to the main menu. So another thing that's quite important that I had to build uh, was collision detection. So the fun kind of really comes from the objects when they start interacting with each other. If you can't have objects interacting, then you don't really have a game. But collision detection can be computationally expensive. There's kind of a lot of iterating of loops and arrays that has to go on behind the scenes. So therefore, there's you can cheat. There's a few ways in which you can cheat. So you've got bounding box collision and pixel perfect collision. So bounding box collision is where you literally have a box drawn around the sprites, um, which you know starts from zero, zero sprite coordinate and then goes to the maximum width of the X and the Y for that sprite. And you've got the same for the little crosshair as well. So if either of those two boxes intersect, then you class it as a collision. So that's a good cheap way of getting collision, but it can be quite inaccurate. Because if you, you know, see that duck in the middle there, if you move the, the crosshair to blow where the duck's head is. I mean, it says it's a collision, but actually it's not. I mean, those two objects aren't actually touching. So what you can do then is you can cheat and you can use 
a combination of pixel perfect collision, which is where pixel perfect collisions, if you have an actual pixel of one sprite physically touching a pixel of another sprite, then you class that as a collision. That's quite expensive to do because you've got lots of iterating through arrays. So what you do is you cheat and you use bounding box collision first. You say, is there an intersection between those two bounding boxes? If there is, you then switch to pixel perfect collision because you don't want to be doing pixel perfect collision between all of the assets all of the time because that would be quite slow and inefficient. So you just wait until you have a bounding box intersection and then you switch to pixel perfect collision, which is kind of a, a good way of cheating it. Okay, so the next bit that we looked at was scene management. I mentioned this a little bit before, but a scene management is a bit like a room. And a room has objects in it. And those objects can move about, they can interact with each other. And as we'll see later, you can actually send messages between the different objects in the room. So the room is a bit like a, a directed graph. So you've got a, a node at the top, which is the room. Then you can add sprites into it. You can add sound effects into it. And then what you do is you add that scene to the render list, and then you say you render this scene. So you're not saying render this duck, render this duck, render this crosser. You just say you render the scene. And anything that's been added to the scene will get drawn at that point. So the way I handled scene management in, in the engine is I have various different uh, render layers. So I've got five set up by default. So anything that's in render layer one gets rendered first. Then anything that's in render layer two gets rendered second and then so on. So what this means is that if you render everything in render layer one first, that will get rendered and then anything in render layer two will get rendered over the top of it. So if you have to have things drawn in a specific order, like a Z order, um, this basically lets you control that quite easily. So the background's always at the back, then you have the ducks, then you have the scoreboard and the duck counters and the bullet counters. So if the duck flies behind the scoreboard, you don't want it to appear in front of the scoreboard, you want it to appear behind it. And then you've got the crosshair, which goes over all of that. And then we had that billboard animation. So when it said level two and it kind of scrolled down saying level two, that was in the, the topmost layer. So really what you're doing is you're getting a kind of a pseudo 3D representation of the scene as a render order. It's a bit like when you're in PowerPoint and you know, a box appears in the wrong layer. So you have to right click on it and say send to back or you know, send back a layer. It's the same concept as that. And what we do is around the whole scene system, we have what's called a collision manager. So the collision manager is what will look at everything that's in the scene and it will try and work out if any of those objects are colliding within that scene. So if I've got the crosshair, for example, when I run the, the logic for the crosshair, I can say, I, you know, are you colliding with anything in this scene? It will come back and it will give you a list and it'll say, yes, I'm actually colliding with this duck here. So when you press the button and you send out the you know, the gunshot message, you can then easily work out that the crosshair is interacting with that duck. So we then want to send a message to the sound manager and say, play the gun sound effect. And then we send a message to the duck and we say, okay, well, if you've been hit, switch to the duck, um, duck shot state and then the duck death state where it kind of moves, falls down the screen. And all of that is kind of being executed in that tight loop at 60 frames a second, hopefully. You know, everything's going as fast as it can. So we go into our draw method. It goes, okay, uh, layer one, render that scene. Layer two, render everything there. Layer three, render that, and then so on. But as it's doing that, it's calling the updates method on each of these different objects that are in the scene. So the next thing we've got then is entity messaging. So each asset in the scene doesn't know anything about any other assets. I mean, you could kind of hard code it. So it's all kind of global so that you know that the crosshair can know about a duck in the code. I mean, you could do it that way, but you really want to decouple everything so that each game entity is actually anonymous. So it's a bit like microservices running in a container. Now at this point, we don't want to go full enterprise, but you know, as you're all at a professional software development conference, I suppose we kind of need to work, mention the word enterprise somewhere so that you can prove to your employees that you're getting value. But the concepts are kind of similar to how you do it, you know, messaging through something like RabbitMQ. It's kind of a similar process or similar concepts, but kind of simplified. So what we do is we have a channel system in the engine that are built. And it's very, very simple. So you can add a new channel. So you might have a channel called duck hit, and then you can send messages to one of those channels. 
So the crosshair could work out that it's actually intersected with the duck and it could send a message to the duck hit channel. And each duck is monitoring those channels uh, for a message about its own instance and it can then interact and do something at that point. So it's a good way of decoupling all of the objects in a game. Now going back to what I was saying about RenderOS Studio that I worked on many years ago and engines like um, Unreal Engine, a lot of these work in the same way. It's all about sending messages between different entities and then having the entities themselves work out what to do when they receive that message. So it's kind of the similar, similar principle. So in this case, we've got the crosshair that can send out a duck hit message. When the duck receives the duck hit message, it knows to play the flashing animation. It might do that for so many seconds and then it will switch to its death state, which will give you that little dropping animation. It plays a little penny whistle sound. Once the duck goes off screen, it basically then destroys its own instance. At the same time, we have a, a gun trigger sound effect going to the sound effects manager. At that point, it plays the nice M60 kind of gunshot sound. So I'm pretty sure all farmers, when they go duck hunting, use an M60. When a duck receives its message, you know, as well as doing its um, sort of death sequence, it might send a message to the scoreboard and say, I've been legitimately hit by a bullet, sends 10 points, and then the scoreboard automatically adjusts. A duck hit message can go to the bullet counter, so it knows to deduct a bullet. And the same with the actual duck counter for the level. So it knows a duck's been shot. If it's been legitimately shot, it turns blue. If the duck escapes and flies off the screen, then it turns red. So techniques like this just make it really easy to wire up all your different entities. So the code for the duck and the code for the sound effect manager, they're all very self-contained. They don't know about anything else outside of their own bit of code. But then it makes it just really easy to tie everything together with these very simple messages. I said the, uh, the channel system is very, very basic at the minute. So there's no concept of a return at the moment. Uh, so if, uh, if you want to have one entity send a message to the other and then that send a return message. It kind of doesn't support that directly. You're going to have to clodge it a bit. So one of the upgrades I want to do is to add an automatic return or RTX channel into a message. Um, I need some kind of concept of message ordering, so I've not built that in yet. And also having correlation IDs and batching, kind of the things you'd expect from like, you know, RabbitNQ or any of the other queuing systems that are out there. But I didn't really need it for this game, so I haven't built it yet. Okay, so some of the future goals that I want to build with this. Um, so I want to really build a game that's a replica of um, Horace Ghost Skin. I don't know if anyone on here is old enough to remember that. It was a very popular game on the ZX Spectrum. So you've got this little character Horace, and you can go to the ski shop and you can buy your skis, and you have to go through the slalom run. If you get to the bottom without crashing, you then win money to then go back to the ski shop. So a very, very fun game. Another game I want to build, um, I think this was more popular in America than over in the UK or Europe, but it's a game called Number Munchers. It's an educational game for teaching uh, basic math concepts to kids. So I was thinking this could be actually quite a fun little thing to build just to help my son with uh, learning his multiple multiplications. So that's a little game that I'm planning to build. And then something else I really want to do is kind of a, a cross between uh, something like Oregon Trail and a text adventure. So you can probably tell that I'm really into into old retro games. I still think they're better than a lot of the games that come out these days, just because they force you to use your imagination. But I've I've always loved the concept behind Oregon Trail, especially if you've played ever played the original. I mean, if you've not heard of it, it's effectively just a resource management game, but it's really good fun. Cool. And another one I wanted to look at was a kind of uh, speedball or speedball two style uh it's not really football it's kind of more like a uh, fatal frisbee i guess is a good way of describing it but that'd be a good little sort of fun game to build with this engine as well so you've got like a scrolling uh stadium that you're playing and lots of different characters that you can control so i think that'd be quite good fun so some final thoughts before i sort of switch over to visual studio and just give you a little code tour demo so the whole reason this project existed was a way of trying to cope with um, lockdown last year. It's ironic as I say this because the UK is in lockdown as we speak. So kind of the similar, but it doesn't quite feel as bad this time around, mainly because the schools are a bit more organised. 
But at the time, I needed something just to focus on, just to take my mind away from a lot of the other stuff that was going on. And this was the project that did that. It's kind of something I recommend everyone should do, is try and just take on some kind of little creative project that's completely disconnected from what you might do at work. You know, don't give yourself any kind of pressure over it. Some days I'd spend an hour on this engine. Some days I'd spend 10 minutes. Some days I just wouldn't even touch it at all. But you always try and just move that needle ever so slightly and kind of build something for yourself, which is kind of where this project came from. Yeah, so the concept is, you know, still code for fun. You know, a lot of us spend a lot of time doing enterprise stuff, solving the same problems time and time again. You know, now I've been kind of in this industry for several decades now. You kind of see the same problems and same things getting recycled just through different technologies. And it kind of gets a bit boring after a while. So it's always good to remember to have some fun with what you do with your chosen craft. So that's the main part of the talk. So how are we doing? We've kind of finished quite early. So what I'm going to try and do is switch over to Visual Studio. Actually, it's got to GitHub first. So I'm presuming everyone can still see the screen because it says I'm still sharing. Oops. Okay. Please do assign me out. Okay. Exit game 2D. Okay. So if you go into the GitHub project, um, I've tried to make this kind of reasonably presentable in here so that if anyone does want to play around with any of the code, then it should be fairly easy to get up and going. So the best place to start when you load the solution is to go into these tutorial folders. Um, I do, I've got a list of about 15 total tutorials I want to write. I just haven't got around to finishing them yet. But we start off with things like, you know, a blank screen, drawing a sprite, moving a sprite around a the screen, then getting it to track the mouse, rendering fonts, and then collision detection. And then we've got the actual engine itself in ExoGame 2D, or ExoGame Engine. This is kind of where the guts of everything is that I've had to, render, uh, that I've had to work on. And then we've got the Conway's Game of Life code in here. This is quite a small example. It's not too complex. And then we have the duck attack code itself. So in here, you can see we've got all the different game states. I've got the main menu, the playing game, for example. So you, as you get to shuffle, sorry, to shuffle, saw the word shuffle there and just read it out. As you get to look through some of the code, you can just kind of see how things are wired up. So here you can see, you know, we're adding all of the different sprites into the scene. We're setting up different channels for the score, the duck hit and the gun fired. You know, initializing the billboard. So hopefully it's fairly straightforward to go through. So I load up Visual Studio. So I'll try to kind of put everything neat into different folders. So a lot of the renderers that are supported by the game are in this renderers folder. So we've got animated sprites. This is where you can just literally load load a frame texture and add it into an array and then you can basically tell it to you know switch to the next frame which just iterates a frame counter and then depending on whether you're doing linear or ping pong animation it'll automatically work out what frame um, needs to be played and then you can just auto increment the frames um, at whatever speed you want so if you want to increment it a frame per second or a, you know increment it one frame at a time as it renders through the game loop, obviously you're going to get the animation playing very, very fast. You need to kind of think about the speed that you want to play the animation. Got a class in here, which actually stole. Actually, no, it didn't steal. It's open source. I borrowed from somewhere else, which I've sort of referenced here. So a guy called John McDonald and Gary Texmo. Got some uh, code here for drawing things like circles, um, arcs, field rectangles which is kind of what i use for the user interface library and um, their code was originally written for xna so the, the code is quite the code is quite old but because xna and mono game are virtually identical it didn't really take much effort to get it working in here but if you're wanting to draw some user interface elements like buttons or drawing like a heads-up display and you just wanted to do like a big rectangle for example you can just use this library which is quite good and then we have the the basic sprite code, which is where you can load up um, different assets or graphics from the asset pipeline. You've got a way of doing uh, collision, so 
if, if this sprite instance, for example, was a duck and you've got another sprite, which is the crosshair, you can pass one into the other and say, do I collide? And it'll give you a pixel perfect um, response of whether it collides or not. So I'm hoping a lot of this stuff will actually be quite straightforward to work through. Um, so the good thing is, because it, well, I don't know if you see this as a good thing or not, because it doesn't use async and await, and you basically start off with a main loop, it's very easy to follow through. So you, you kind of find main, and then you just debug through it at that point. So you haven't got any kind of weird async stuff going off and doing things in the background and then returning. It's all kind of very linear, which is quite useful. So that's kind of really what I wanted to show you. It's a fairly short talk, but if you are interested in doing 2D game development in .NET and you're kind of wanting something that you can play with to get you started, then you can go ahead and use this engine. It's you know, hopefully fairly straightforward to use. The code's all MIT licensed, so you can kind of do what you want with it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Apart from saying that if you are obviously you're struggling with things like lockdown you you know you do want to kind of keep your mind active so I, I really do recommend just working on something non-work related something where the pressure is completely off just to give you something to focus on which is quite cool this is this was kind of my little lockdown project um early last year and it kind of helped me get through some of the monotony of homeschooling and being stuck in the house okay so with that thank you for, thank you very much for coming along um I appreciate for everyone, you know, watching lots of talks that are online and not face to face is is hard and it's quite it can be quite tiring, especially if you've been doing workshops as well. So imagine you've done two days of workshops and three days of talks, which is quite hardcore. Uh, but you know, congratulations for getting to the end of the conference. Hopefully at some point this year or maybe early next year, we can all start getting back into a room with each other and actually sort of doing traditional conferences, which will be quite fun. So again, if you have any questions, if you can drop them in Slack in channel or track three, I believe we're in. If you could tag me in them as well, just in case I can't get to them straight away, because I now need to go back and do a maths lesson. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, let me know and I'll do my best to try and answer them in Slack. I believe the Slack team will be open for a few days after the conference, so you should still have access to all of that. So with that, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.